Hello, this is Robert Chen with Learn Lodi, a free resource for learning how to market, treatment plan, place, and maintain locator overdenture implants. The purpose of today's video is to discuss utilizing cone beam CT imaging and software to optimize your treatment planning and produce the most predictable surgical and restorative outcomes. In this video, we'll be evaluating a CT scan to place four Zest Lodi implants in an edentulous mandible. A little background on me. I am a co-owner of Reveal Diagnostics, and we run dental cone beam CT imaging centers servicing the San Francisco Bay Area. In the years prior to this, I worked with Anatomage, a leader in CT imaging software and implant surgical guides. So from my own experience, I've spent years optimizing patient scans both at the time of capture as well as manipulating it downstream with cutting edge software. That is, at the time of capture, looking at little things such as settings, positioning, and protocols to make the raw data itself as good as possible. And then downstream on the other side, how we can take that image data and make it really work for us and give us the most diagnostically relevant clinical information. And that's what I'd like to share with you today. So I've opened up a patient scan and I'll walk you through the process of planning an implant supported overdenture using the Zest Lodi narrow diameter implant system. Reveal Diagnostics works very closely with the universities, the implant companies, CT manufacturers, and software companies all to integrate the various aspects of treatment planning and the surgical process to generate the best plan and most predictable outcomes. So in this video and in additional videos to follow, we'll share with you what our teams have developed and why it works. This first case here will be a relatively high level introduction just to the basic tools in navigating within a CT image. Considerations when requesting a scan. We want to take a scan from a calibrated, high quality cone beam CT machine. Just within the machine settings, there are a number of factors that will contribute to your scan quality. Higher resolution scans will give you better visualization of the bone, margins, and density. However, it'll also increase the amount of radiation to the patient and extend the scan time. Longer scans can be really challenging for some patients who can't remain still, and movement can completely throw off the accuracy of your scan. The scanning tech will also need to scan the patient in the optimal position within the machine's field of view and adjust the KVMA values depending on the patient's pone density and the amount of metal. An imaging center with a highly trained staff is critical to getting the best images, and our centers employ only hospital-trained certified radiology technologists for this reason. So this here is a scan that's already been taken. What you're looking at now is what we call the section tab or the multi-planar view. It essentially breaks the scan up into three plane slicings. So this axial slicing in the top left, sagittal slicing in the top right, and coronal slicing here in the bottom left. Almost every CT imaging software will give you these tools. And this is the basic package. You can use it to search through your 3D scan volume, to check for pathology, take measurements, and evaluate bone height, width, and relative density. So for example, evaluating the maxillary sinus, we can manipulate each of these three views. So let's start with this axial view here. And the level of this axial slice is represented by this orange line. And if I move this line superiorly, you'll see that the axial slice is changing. So right now we're looking at the maxilla and the very bottom of the sinus here. And I can go from there and continue to move superiorly. And we'll look at the sinus all the way from inferior to superior, and here at the very top, and we can just bring that orange line back down and we'll move from superior to inferior. So 
that same process can be done using this sagittal slice. So right now, this sagittal slice is represented by this green line right here, and it's about on the mid-sagittal plane right here. So if I start and I move this green line towards the patient's right side, we'll see as we move laterally, we'll get that same effect and we'll see the maxillary sinus there and we can move laterally and back medially. And we can do the same thing now here for the patient's left side See the sinus here and move laterally and medially. The same concept again applies to this coronal slice. So we can start maybe in the anterior and follow that sinus as we go from anterior to posterior like that and back towards the anterior. So that's very useful in looking at things like the sinus, but there's one big problem to this. And these views are adaptations from the medical CT scan standards, and the mouth isn't aligned well to be used in these rigid slicing planes. While it's an excellent way to evaluate the sinus, we orient ourselves in dentistry using more functionally relevant references than superior, inferior, medial, lateral, and anterior, posterior. So let's start here. Just for example, if I wanted to plan my implants from a view like this, what I might do is move the sagittal slice down into the height of the mandible, and I can move each of these. So let's say I'm planning an implant in about the 23 region. So this right here gives me, in the sagittal view, gives me a pretty good view of the bony height and the ridge width. So I'll just blow this up so we can see it a little bit better. And let me show you what it would look like if I took a measurement. So I can click here and click here, and that would give me an estimation of the ridge width. And I can do the same thing here. If we were to measure out about 12 millimeters of height. And that works great. Now, if I wanted to move distal, and let's say I wanted to place no implant number 20, and let's say we want to move that and place it just mesial to the mental foramen, which we can see right here. And we might place it right there. So again, let's go into the sagittal slice and do the same process. Might have about this much ridge width. And we'll measure out about 12 millimeters again. <clears throat> and there we have it. Now the problem with what we just did here, and the reason it doesn't work with number 20, but it does with number 23, is the measurement that we just took isn't a straight measurement of ridge width. So when we're working within these planes, we need to be very mindful of the measurements that we're taking. The measurement that we're taking is actually the length of this green line or the width of this green line. So what that means is we just measured this right here when in fact the measurement that we wanted was the actual ridge width right here. So 3.2 millimeters versus 5.1 millimeters is a huge difference. And we need to be very conscious of that as we move forward with our treatment planning. So let me delete that 5.1. And this is what we want. So how do we get that? There are some better tools that are more specific to dentistry. And we would call that within this software, the arch section tab. Now, the arch section tab, instead of using um, axial, sagittal, and coronal slices, it gives us what we call cross-sectional arch slices for better treatment planning. So now we can more accurately measure the true width of the ridge at each of our implant sites.
and specifically for the Zest Lodi implant system, we've learned we would like to place four implants in the anterior mandible, and we'd like to space them out seven millimeters from center to center. So let's do that now. I will increase the size here for this axial view. And what I can do is start from the center. And I'll take a measurement here and go distal 3.5 millimeters, about. And we'll just simulate our implant with a little circle here. So 3.5 millimeters to the distal. I'll delete that measurement. And I'll do another one. So from the center of this implant, we'll take seven millimeters distal. And again, I'll make a little circle just to simulate that implant. And we'll do the same thing here. About three and a half millimeters from the center. And I'll place that with an implant. And then I'll do seven millimeters again and place a little circle to indicate an implant. And that can be our finished treatment plan as we might conventionally do it. And with cone beam CT images, we can have high confidence that there's adequate bone height and width. So I can take a look at this implant at site number 23 and I can take my measurement tool and just measure how much width we have and also how much height we have. So easily knowing that there's enough bone to place each of these implants. And I can do the same thing at each of these sites. And notice that as I drag this green line along the arch, it's actually following the arch so that the slice I'm looking at is always a straight perpendicular cross section. And that's exactly what we want for measuring the bone width. Now, because we have this full CT volume, we can do much better with our treatment plan. We can see the mental frame in here and we can optimize our AP spread from that. So I've already mapped out the inferior alveolar nerve canal on the patient's left side. And let me do the same thing with the right, and I'll show you what we can do to maximize our AP spread. So in this panel view on the bottom, you can see the canal. And what I'll do is click on this button for a new nerve, and I will just click on points along the canal, starting in the posterior near the mandibular foramen, and just click on points as we go, and moving towards the mesial. And as we start to lose visualization, we can follow, here is the mental foramen, and I'll follow it out with um, my mouse pointer. And you can see as I'm following it out, we can verify on this axial section, uh, we can see that nerve coming out of the mental foramen. So I'll click done. And again, to verify, I can toggle visibility off and on, and we can see the mental foramen right there and right there. So we have mapped it properly. Now, from here, what I'll do is delete each of these circles that we've done with our conventional planning. And now we can say, knowing where the mental foramen is, let me start my implant planning there and work towards the mesial. So let's say if we're looking at five millimeters from the mental foramen, I can take this measurement and say, we'll place our first implant right here five millimeters, and we'll do the same thing on the other side, five millimeters. So here is my first implant, and here is my first implant. So these are the two terminal implants. I'll just delete these measurements now. So now, as we're looking through the arch, how much room do we have? So I'll take the measurement tool again, and let me just measure the arch length here, and we have about 34 millimeters. So what I might do is if we're spacing out four implants, let me place them 11 millimeters apart from center to center. 
and that will give us a pretty good estimation and about evenly spaced implants. So, take my measurement tool again, click on the center of this implant, and here is 11 millimeters. 11 millimeters right here, here, and I'll place that second implant. And we'll do the same thing from here, um, right here, the center of this implant, and we'll go about 11 millimeters. And I'll go ahead and place that second implant. There we go. So now we can get a much better AP spread across these four implants. And again, we can go through and evaluate the bone. So let's check to make sure that we have adequate ridge width and height to place these implants. And we can continue to do this and take these measurements at each of the sites. And moving to 26, same concept here. And to 29 here. And I'm just doing it very quick and easy to give you the basic idea that, yes, we have enough space to plan those implants. Um, and we can, of course, take our measurements much more carefully and go through that whole process as well. But in a nutshell, that's how we can accurately evaluate how, if there's enough bone for implant placement and get us the maximum AP spread all from the cone beam CT scan. So... The final tool I'd like to show you today with this video is really how we can incorporate the advanced 3D visualization tools and what benefits that it can provide to us um, in terms of evaluating the relational spacing for each of these implant fixtures and also critical structures as we're looking at the inferior alveolar nerve. So this is especially important in cases like these where there are multiple implant units and um, spacing is very important. Parallelism is very important. So I'll jump into the implant tab now and we'll take a look at how that works. So I'll zoom in here and this is our 3D volume and it shows uh, the bone and it has a, this orange translucent view so that we can we can have a little bit of transparency through it We can see the models that we've placed here So one of these being the inferior alveolar nerve and then we'll go ahead and throw in those four implants So starting from scratch again, I'm going to click on the pano implant button and I find this Placing implants in a pano environment is just the easiest way for multi-unit cases. So I'll just drop in number 20, um, 29, and we'll again start those as distal as possible. So very close to the mental frame in there. And of course, we'll go back and hone that spacing. And then we'll also do number 23 and 26. And we'll just space these out for now as evenly as possible and uh, make adjustments once we get back into the 3D environment. So let's do that now. I'll click on 3D implant, and this shows us each of these implants planned in this mandible, and so far it looks pretty good. So typically we're saying we want to keep this, these terminal implants about five millimeters from the mental foramen, um, in my opinion, with the canal mapped out very cleanly like this, and we have full visualization of any anterior loops, we can pretty confidently get even closer than five millimeters. So um, maybe as close as two, but we can leave it at five just to kind of 
go over that and whatever you're most comfortable with is going to be the best way to go. Let me turn on some additional tools for us. So first I'll do this and I'm going to enable collision warnings and it'll look a little bit messy at first but the benefit of this is now it's telling us the distance between each of these models that we have within the software. So um, these terminal implants are 1.7 and 2 millimeters from the inferior alveolar nerve. So let's just go ahead and move it until it says 5 millimeters. So here we go. About 4.9, 5.1. We'll leave it at 4.9 here. Same thing here. I'm going to move this until it says about 5 millimeters. And okay, we'll go with 4.9. Now, between each of these implants, we have um, the distance shown. And a, di a little difference within the software here is it's not telling us the distance from center to center. It's telling us the difference from the edge of the implant to the edge of the adjacent implant. So what I would need to do first is let me click on these. And these are just generic implant models that the software starts with. And we can choose any implant manufacturer we like, and it'll throw in the actual model for the implant itself. So we're using Zest Anchors Lodi implants for this case, and I am going to change each of these to a Zest Lodi. We'll do 2.9 by 10. So same thing here. We'll go to the um, Zest Anchors Lodi and change each of these so that it's the proper implant for us. So the nice part about this is, especially when we're looking in very tight spaces, having the exact model for the implant that you're using can really make the difference between a case that you'd wanna take on and maybe one that uh, you would pass up or choose a different treatment plan for. So now that we have each of these implants, we can see the distance in between each one. So um, again, smaller implants, so I will move these again distal. We can get a little bit closer to the mental frame in here, so about five. So that's from the edge of the implant to the nearest mapped part of the nerve for us. So about five millimeters on each side there. And then now between each of these, we're showing seven millimeters between these two implants, 8.3 and 8.6 millimeters here. So we can move these implants distal and move this one mesial. And essentially, what we'll want to do is try to get it somewhat similar here in terms of how much space we have. So I'm just trying to get something um, about, let's see, we're about eight. 7.9 and 8. Perfect. So we have 8 millimeters from the edge of each implant to the edge of the next adjacent implant. Now, a couple of different things we can do. Clicking on each of these implants, it now instantly gives us these cross-sectional views right here that we were using uh, in the previous screen also this axial view, but now the axial view is a little bit more relevant for us. It's instead of a pure axial, it's along um, the axis of the implant. So it's always going to be perpendicular to that implant. So if we have an angled implant, it'll follow that um, with this slicing. And then also this will give us a mesial distal view. So from here, I would check each of these implants to make sure that we have adequate bone across each one. And we may need to adjust, place it in the center of bone here. And now we can also see the angle that we've planned these implants at. Um, we've dropped them in and they all have a zero degree angle, so they're all perfectly parallel right now. If I wanted to adjust the angle of this implant, you'll see this measurement right here tells you the angle of divergence. So one tool I have is I can make all of these parallel. So I'll check this box for all mandibular implants parallel. And then now if I were to make that change again, you can watch in the 3D volume that all of these implants will snap together and they're moving in unison. So again, these numbers reset to zero degrees.
So let me go ahead and check each of these implants and we'll see, is there adequate bone? Do I need to make some fine adjustments here and change the angle? And what we'll end up doing is in each of these cases, we'll say, how do I need to adjust the angle versus implant location within bone? Or do I have to compromise keeping them all exactly parallel? Maybe, maybe I can uncheck this box for all mandibular implants parallel and then tweak one individual implant if need be. So that's how we can optimally plan using this 3D software. And now that we're comfortable with that, let's discuss one additional trick we can use at the time of scan acquisition to give us even more tools within this 3D planning environment. And to me, this is ultimately the best way to be planning. And for patients with existing well-fitting dentures, we're using a scanning protocol that we developed that will allow us the best visualization for prosthetic planning. And that comes without having to scan the patient multiple times or creating, spending the time to create um, or modifying these special CT scanning appliances. This is another implant over denture case, and I've already done most of the treatment planning to get where we left off with the other case, but I wanted to use this to show you how we can utilize the denture in the scan just straight from one patient scan. So we've taken his existing denture, and you can see that right here, and you can see the contours of it, and we've aligned it with a radiopaque material green mousse, and that separates the denture from the mucosa here. And then we also scan the patient with cotton rolls in the vestibule, and you can see the outline here. And we keep the tongue away from the denture um, using cotton rolls, and you can see there's no tongue here. So you can see the difference between what we've done here in the mandible, where we can very clearly see the margins of this denture in the cross-section, versus what we have in the maxilla, where you do see the margins here, and then it gets lost from the lip. And you can see the curve of the lip right here, and it just, it just completely blends in with the, with the denture. So had we scanned this patient just at rest, um, wearing his denture, everything in here would just be filled as a, as a gray blob, and we wouldn't see this nice differentiation here. So as we scroll through all of this, you can follow the denture as we're going distal. And it's a really nice tool to be able to use for our treatment. Now, just to show you a little bit more about what this means, I want to take a quick detour and use a different 3D rendering mode. And this one is our soft tissue rendering. And I want to do a clipping on the mid-sagittal plane here and rotate it so that you can see what we're working with. So again, this denture here has about the same density in the scan as the soft tissue. So it really shows up as the same color when we're taking the scan. And then you can see here's that green mousse and here is the bone. And um, kind of neat, you can see, definitely see the outline of that cotton roll here in the vestibule. And um, that gives us a little bit better idea of how the patient was scanned. And, and just as a neat thing, some of these renderings can be useful in terms of looking at the bone. So if we were to change this into a bone rendering, a lot of people will use this to determine if there's enough bone around each of those implants. Um, my opinion is we want to be, of course, very careful because depending on where we have the brightness settings, if you turn it down, um, it may appear that there is less bone than there really is. And if you turn it up, the opposite can happen. Some of that soft tissue starts getting um, counted in the threshold here for the bone rendering. So, so as a rule of thumb, we typically say always use the 2D sections, and that's the best indicator of bone density. But um, getting back to, to this right here, what is the benefit of having the, uh, the denture in this scan? Let me turn this back to our translucent teeth view, and let me show you what we're working with here. Now, 
we'd like to take a look at prosthetic space, how much height do we have, and also the occlusal forces across these implants, how that lines up. Um, so first, let's take a measurement here to say, do we have enough prosthetic space? With the Zeslody implant system, we're looking for somewhere in the range of 9 to 11 millimeters. Right here, we have about 7.3. So, um, some of the things we can do here, um, treatment options, we can move this implant towards the buckle. So say we place it right here. Is that enough space? We can take another measurement. And we're looking at just below nine. So um, we can explore the option of rotating this implant a little bit. So let me put it back a little bit better in the center of bone. Now we can rotate this implant and angle it a little bit more towards the buckle. So now, again, how much space do we have? And it looks like we have adequate an adequate amount of space now. Um, some other options are we can reduce the ridge. So say we didn't want to angle the implant that way, we're going to move it back and keep this angulation we can place these implants subcrestally um, with the intention of reducing the ridge at the time of surgery. So if that's an option, we can place it like that. Now, before we make that determination, we're going to want to evaluate each of these implant sites, make sure that works, and we can plan these to about the same height as we're looking at it in 3D. Do we have enough prosthetic space for each of these implants? Excellent. Good. So now we have the ability to use the denture as we're planning each of these implants, we can see the prosthetic space and take the measurements and ensure that we'll have that 9 to 11 millimeters required for the attachments. And we've explored some different options, moving the implant, tilting the implant, and um, reducing the ridge to gain some additional space for the, um, for, for the attachments. So from here, this can be our final implant plan, and we can take this knowledge and uh, place our implant surgically. Uh, the other option from here is we can send this information, this planned uh, cone beam CT file, we can save it and send it to Anatomage, and we would also send them a stone model of the edentulous mandible and they would fabricate a surgical guide for us. Um, and there's no additional work required. Um, and it's a very elegant process. We'll cover some more of that in the next videos to follow. So today we've looked at a few different ways we can utilize software to maximize our CBCT images. And we started with clumsily taking measurements in a medical derived multi-planar view. And we then upgraded to this curved arch sectional slicing, which lets us take more accurate measurements of ridge width and more easily space out our implants. And then we moved into the 3D treatment planning tools that gives us more custom views that incorporate implant spacing, relative angles, the ability to map critical structures, and show the actual implant models in our plan. And finally, we adjusted our scanning protocols to include the denture to further hone our treatment plan and ensure adequate prosthetic space and line up forces over the implants. And that's this last one right here. So uh, I want to thank Zest and Dr. Michael Scherer for their assistance in continuing to innovate and improve the way we incorporate CT into implant dentistry. And our mission at Reveal Diagnostics is to make CT imaging more accessible to every clinician. And educational videos such as these are really making a big difference. And 
I would encourage each of you to explore your options and partner with a good imaging lab and an implant rep who has the knowledge and is driven to help you grow your practice because we owe it to our patients and nobody wins when an implant fails. So the technology exists to know exactly what to expect before surgery and have a plan that we can execute predictably and just use the technology that's available and use it to its fullest. So our next video will continue on this theme and we'll discuss the process and benefits of guided surgery. And in the meantime, if you have any questions or comments, you can contact us at uh, Reveal Diagnostics. I have our 888 phone number here and that's 973-8325. You can visit our website at revealdiagnostics.com or just an easy way if you want to send us an email. It's info at revealdiagnostics.com. Thank you again for your time. I appreciate your attention. Um, I'll look forward to working with you on the next video.